Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. If you're interested in learning about the ketogenic diet like I was, to save my own life, then this is probably the podcast for you. Eight years ago, I knew nothing about it. Six years ago, it saved my life. Three years ago, I started researching and talking with some of the authorities in the field and attending medical conferences about this to understand why and how keto so dramatically changed my and my wife's Judy's lives. The purpose of this podcast is to share our journey of discoveries with you in understanding how keto is so effective in proving so many different conditions from obesity, epilepsy, diabetes, infertility, MS, Alzheimer's, heart disease, to name a few. So take a step away from all the hype you've probably heard and roll up your sleeves with me and join me weekly to explore this living miracle that anyone can access. We'll talk science, we'll talk food. We'll explore its history and evolution to today, which is that the sheer wonder of the ketogenic way of eating has changed untold number of lives, unlike anything before it. And in case I forget to mention it, please join our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp, and I want to uh, give a little rejoinder from part one to part two of my interview with Dr. Stephen Kinane. And I think his work, and I think he's a remarkable guy, and he's fun to talk to, and he's very knowledgeable, so he can go in any direction. But first, I thought I'd just sort of wrap up some ideas from last podcast with him, the first half, and what made him spectacularly sensational in the world of the ketogenic diet and the world of brain health in particular for the aging brain was that he was the one that finally got to use, knew how to use the equipment for a keto PET scan. So he could see things that had been postulated a couple decades before. And so what I mean specifically is this, the brain and the brain cells and their ability to use glucose and their ability to use ketones. So the PET scan, which is a tracer that's put into glucose, and you get to see where the glucose is taken up. Those are all those colorful images of the brain when people are going through various things, both for cancer and uh, from eye movement, what part of the brain is lit up when something happens. or And so it's fascinating. But what he did, he took the same, and it took a long time. This wasn't like, aha, and they just had to flip the switch was to get a tracer into ketones and so they could actually measure the ketone uptake into brain cells at the various parts of the brain, of course. So that was a big deal. As he references, or did reference in the first half, that it was pop postulated and that they had determined, they, meaning uh, specifically this paper came out of Sweden in the Karolinska Institute in 1991, which simply compared, you know, the the arterial blood, which is bringing in the oxygen and bringing in the glucose and all the goodies, all the nutrients, and the venous return and what's missing. So it's kind of a math problem. What was there and what's not there, and therefore what's missing went to the brain cells. That's how they do that. So they call it uh, arterial venous comparison. And so in that comparison, now we're talking, what's that, 20, almost 30 years ago? Almost 30 years ago, it was postulated that what was interesting was ketones um, had no change. In other words, a young brain and an older brain use ketones equally well. So the capacity to take up ketones for your brain cells, hippocampus and all these other spectacular areas we need, hippocampus being memory primarily and other things, emotions, that uh, it didn't change. But what did change was it's the brain's cells and the neurons' ability to bring in glucose. Hmm. So... As you remember, what was the COP, as Dr. Kunane talked about, was insulin. Insulin was becoming less and less effective, less and less efficient, and you might say insulin resistant. So all these are the same words, but it became less effective. And so insulin in the brain, this is, um, which is a little bit different than insulin in the rest of the body, but similar as well in places, that it became less effective, so it couldn't push in the glucose as well. So now the brain is gradually being starved of glucose, not because there isn't glucose available, but because the insulin isn't pushing it in. The insulin is a little more insulin resistant, it's ineffective, it's less efficient. So long comes this alternative fuel, which has actually always been used. 24-7, your body has always been using ketones anyway, but our dietary high-carb 
and high fat tended to block it in certain ways or make it so it wasn't as available. So this is what Dr. Kinane showed that it hasn't changed. And in fact, if you increase the amount of ketones in the blood, anywhere in the body, it will increase the amount of ketones delivered to the brain cells. So it's a, a function of the concentration of ketones in your body. That's why it's kind of an easy math problem when you think about it that way. More ketones in the blood, more ketones in the brain. And that's why you get some of these spectacular changes. Okay, so that was the last one. He also brought up a really interesting point about uh, women with PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome. We know that it's um, it's uh, growth, hair growth, secondary hair growth, male characteristics on women. They're usually uh, not ovulating and ovulatory, or and they may or may not be overweight, uh, but it's having uh, PCOS is one of the, I don't know if it's the number one, but it's very high on the list for infertility. So he's saying PCOS women also showed, and they were in their 30s, also showed strong correlations with a decreased ability to use glucose neurologically. And he said the equivalent of a 70-year-old. Now, isn't that interesting? So PCS with decline, with decreased ability to use glucose in brain cells the equivalent of a 70-year-old. That's a big difference. So not only is it infertile and these other things, it's neurological. Okay, now on to part two. Part two, I had to re-listen to it myself just to remember that part two, we get into a lot of different things. We quickly talk about vegetarianism, which he said, you know, I really don't think it's, uh, I'll use the word healthy for, or has any particular metabolic advantage uh, and then when you add on, he said, you know, there's a lot of anti-nutrients, which are the phytates, the oxalates, and the lectins, which tend to block the nutrients in the vegetables. So it's not just a list of vitamins and minerals that are in the vegetables, it what blocks it. So you have your goodies, and then you subtract the things that block it, and that's the net thing that you get from vegetables. And that's not talked about, nor is it actually represented when uh, vegetarians, and when you see information on vegetables in particular, they say, high in vitamin C. Well, What's blocking that vitamin C? Some is available, some is not, depending on the context. You find it. That was interesting. We get into more of that. He says, then there's always the other aspects that come in with um, you know, the, the pesticides and so on. So it's a whole other variable that, yeah, it wasn't there with ancient man. He says, well, maybe ancient man, meaning Paleolithic, had other problems and other pollutants they had to worry about. Contaminants, as he says. Uh, also, he mentioned mercury, lead, docks, and PCPs, uh, pesticides. Again. And we may get into that in a whole nother topic because it is pertinent. He didn't let proteins or meat or fish off the hook completely. He said, you know, they have their issues. They're different issues, though. We got a lot into MCT oils, so medium chain triglycerides. There, We talked primarily on C8 and C10. However, there is value of C14, C12, and um, no research is really on C6. And we got into the comparison of exogenous ketones. He said, you know, the esters are the most efficient at, this is what we know in terms of research, the most efficient in terms of producing beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is one of the three ketones. Salts are less efficient, but it's only at BHB. No acetoacetate and no acetone. And then there's C8. So I asked him, I said, well, do you think some of what we know about C8 is because there's not, there has not been a lot of funding behind finding out about C8? He said, well, there is some public funding, but, you know, there's that truth, but you have to then go and chase public money to get that sort of thing. So I think C8 is always going to be the bottom of the line in that regard. However, here's what I would say. Here's my little caveat, and I love the fact that everybody has their ketometer and their glucometer, the keto mojo or whatever, because you can find out for yourself. If you really want to find out the difference between exogenous ketones, the esters and the salts compared to C8, I believe this is what you'll find out, which is what I found out on me and uh, others who have done this as well, is you'll find out, yes, initially esters and salts are going to have a big bang up in your blood ketones, which is BHP. That's what uh, your blood ketone measurement is based on BHP. And, but it will fall off usually well within three hours. 
whereas you're going to find your C8 is going to be a slow climb and it is still climbing within three hours, getting larger, and it lasts for about five hours. So from my perspective, that it's a natural A, you get all three ketones B, and that it lasts a lot longer, um, I would say that's, I would, you know, that's where I'm going, obviously. And we get into, and he talks about emulsifying an MCT oil, so we're just going to call them MCT oils henceforward, so C8 MCT, and C10, C10 MCT. He calls the C8 the ketogenic MCT. That if you emulsify them, you increase their ketogenic capacity. So you can say, well, that's why if you emulsify your oil in your coffee, or for instance, in the mayo, right? In Judy's mayo, you all have the recipe for that and seen the video, make your mayo with C8, is that when you emulsify it, which is how you make your mayo, you've actually increased the ketogenic capacity of the C8 and uh, what else? We use avocado oil, which is not that ketogenic, but you now have really stretched your C8 to be even more ketogenic. Isn't that pretty cool? There's also a study on that, and I'll post it in the show notes about uh, the effect of emulsifying MCT oils on their increased uh, ketogenic um, production. Okay, so then we got into GABA. Remember GABA? GABA um, amino, um, what is it? GABA is a neurotransmitter, and I can't put, pull up the acronym right now. It's uh, gamma amino benzoic acid. And why you know GABA, you've heard of things like gabapentin, which are tranquilizers or calmers, shall we say, sedatives, that it is a sedative, or in another way, it's an inhibit, neuro, a neurologic uh, inhibitor. Um, that is, you have things like glutamate, which are neurologically uh, exciting, and to balance your turning on neurons is something to turn them off, and that's GABA. So GABA gives kind of a meditative quality to life. You know, that's why people like to sit and sort of chill out, and that's why they have tranquilizers and sedatives and so on. But the issue is about balance. It's not just being turned off or turned on. And so neurologically speaking, a lot of pathologies, a lot of conditions, a lot of diseases, if you will, are from hyper excitation of neurons. So epilepsy is a good example of that. They have a certain part of their brain that gets hyper excitable. Suddenly all these neurons are firing very quickly. They can't be calmed down and then they go into a seizure. So one of the things in the ketogenic diet is ketogenic diet, the ketones feed into Krebs cycle. And I know you don't care about that. Feed into the Krebs cycle and GABA is one of the things that gets produced in abundance because it's part of the Krebs cycle. It's a byproduct. But anyways, ketogenic diet produces GABA, increases GABA. GABA then allows those hyper excitable areas of the brain in general to now calm down, to come into greater, to have control over the balance. So not to inhibit completely, but to have control over the balance. So what does that mean? That means you have autistic spectrum disorder. Actually, I'm on that. By the way, I'm dyslexic. So you have uh, ADHD, ADD, you have autism, you have uh, Asperger's. So that's just there. So it, that's one of the reasons. We're not saying it's the definitive reasons why ketones or the ketogenic diet helps that area, but it does. Um, we it's one of GABA is one of the reasons that it helps epilepsy, but also it's one of the reasons that it helps Alzheimer's and mild cognitive impairment because as you get older, as Dr. Kinane mentions, there's a greater similarity between Alzheimer's and epilepsy in terms of greater excitability of certain parts of the brain, the hippocampus in particular. So if you can bring have control over that balance, not just inhibit, have control over that balance, you then get better cognitive performance, better cognitive capabilities. Isn't that fascinating? So we talked about that for a while, and I thought that was, we went deep on that. So it's about the balance of the, uh, inhibiting the hyper excitability and bringing balance into both being excitable and calming by primarily supporting the calming side. Um, and it's also interesting to know some of the anti-epileptic drugs produce GABA. And so it shows that that crossover, and that's why some of the anti-epileptic drugs are useful in Alzheimer's. So having that connection is very valuable. I'm going to stop here and saying it's going to be a wonderful 
part two conversation with Dr. Stephen Kinane. And always, I appreciate your listening and we'll talk to you more. Bye-bye. I revert back to your book uh, for a moment. And th this is what I got out of it. And I thought that, so I'm a naturopathic doctor and I thought this was, you know, my daily work. You know, I, you know, I'm the one that knew about this and I felt pretty comfortable. I learned a lot, but when I realized how much was required, we had essential fatty acids, of course, and the, the shoreline diet and all that the shoreline diet gave us, you know, the minerals and the iodine in, in, in particular. Do you now look at, you know, modern diet, regardless, unless you have your own garden and your own, you know, protein supply is going to have certain deficiencies. And therefore, do you supplement around it, knowing what you know, or do you go, you know, as you say, brain is opportunistic for fuel. Uh, the body is, it can adapt. Do you, do you say, well, I, I don't think anything's sufficient anymore. So I, you know, you're a supplement taker to some extent, or you just get it from food because that's, that made me think twice. And I'm not much of a supplement guy. Okay. Well, I, I'm not. I'm not a supplement taker either. I've also been participated in quite a few of my own uh, research projects, and my biomarkers for cognitive decline are, are in good shape. The homocysteine, my glucose, my insulin response, uh, my brain ketone uptake, my brain glucose uptake, in fact. So um, I, I have a little bit of confidence that I'm. I'm not doing anything terribly wrong. Um, obviously, if I could grow my own food. Um, I, I, I possibly I would. I'm not sure if that's true, but there's a, a an organic farm nearby that we're members of, and and we use them as much as we can. Uh, I'm not convinced that vegetarianism is is an important part of the solution per se, because there's lots of anti nutrients in in many uh, legumes. Um, the supply of the of the micronutrients is often uh, in, in peril. So, you, and you've got the pesticide issues as uh, just as you do in meat with, with uh, anabolic steroids and God knows what else is in there. So th there is no dietary plan in my view that is, is going to avoid the, the sort of uh, contaminants that are put there by the food industry or by, uh, by agricultural practice today. Uh, so I, I think you, you're going to chase your tail trying to figure out a dietary plan unless you grow your own food. And most of the time, again, the, the body's pretty tough. I'm sure that uh, 100,000 uh, years ago, we had contaminants in our food of a different sort that, um, that we've, we've learned to, to deal with. And uh, we were learning which plants were toxic and which weren't. And, and maybe some people died, but, but, but many didn't. Yeah. So I think the, brain has a, the, brain, the body has a, quite a resistance to some of these products. Uh, obviously, if there's too much mercury in your diet, it, it's going to be or lead or, or any of these mm -hmm. Um, uh, toxic metals, it's, it's a big issue, uh, and dioxins and PCBs and so on. So I'm not, I'm not saying just cover your eyes and, and when you walk down the grocery aisles and just grab whatever you want. But in fact, in grocery stores, I think there's reasonably good control. Uh, maybe I'm naive, but I think there's reasonably good control on the quality of the products that are actually available. So uh, again, I, at a certain point, you sort of, as George Bernard Shaw says, everybody keeps telling me that what I'm eating is, is bad for me, but I, life goes on <laughs> or something to that effect. Yeah. Uh, at some point, you've got to decide. And yep. Yeah, I agree. I agree. No, I'm with you 100%. That is the list, by the way. Times have changed in terms of the toxins. And that certainly was part of our practice. And looking for that, one can over uh, focus a medical practice strictly on environmental toxins, but it's part of who we are now. You know, and and we're uh, and and we're as well. It's it's part of who we were. I think uh, evolving. Yep. No, I hear that. Well, let me swing back to. I'm sort of taking you. I'll, I'll make one exception if I can just add a point sure. though, and that yeah. is the chemicals that we put into the diet, like trans fatty acids, for instance. Um, I, we finally uh, banned them here in yeah. Canada. The the law was passed 15 years ago or something, and the actual uh, effect on the food industry has only just started to take place now. I don't know in in the USA are, are trans fatty acids still permitted in the food supply or. It no, but they've banned it. Uh, I think New York has banned it. So it's interesting. States have stepped up before well, the federal state government. State by state decision now or. Well, it's, it's, it's unusual for states to precede the federal in terms of anything dietary, but uh, that's what New York has done. I think one or two other states, but it seems like federal is going to be imminent. And uh, it's certainly been talked about for the last 20 years since I was back in medical school. So uh, if, we could, if we could ban refined sugar in the same way, I think that would be a, a major 
uh, step forward. But we've we've been so hooked on on the the, the low fat solution to our metabolic problems that I I think that um, you know it's got to change the 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 professional associations from diabetes to heart to medical to di dietetics. Um, I think they all have a learning curve to go through to come to, to grips with the nature of the advice we've been giving over the years. And I, I gather that the American Diabetes Association has just sort of opened the crack, that door a crack in saying that the very low carbohydrate diets are actually look like, surprisingly, look like they might be therapeutically uh, appropriate for uh, in diabetes. I agree. That was very impressive. I think it's the new president or whoever they came on with looking into that. It's like, wow, that was a step so forward. So that's, yeah. This, so maybe the times that they are a changing. Yeah. Well, then you heard, I'm sure that was it last week or the week before there was uh, two people that uh, presented slash testified in front of parliament, speaking of being, you being British and, um, you know, and going through, it, it tried to, it stopped just shy of saying, it said we were, this information has been misrepresented about the low fat for the previous what, 50 years, and it's just not true. And so he, uh, without uh, name calling, um, and I forgot his name, but he was a cardiologist who got up there and says, this is what I've seen. This is what I do. And of course, he has a book out, but it was a great presentation. And then Zoe uh, Harcom uh, followed up with, with that as well. So the fact that it took place in Parliament was the point that um, it's interesting to see that it didn't. It, it was, this is a grassroots movement, but there's some pretty interesting movements happening at the top as well. Top being parliament. Top being was that in the UK, you mean, when you yeah, say parliament? UK. Yeah. Yep, that was in, yeah, I forgot the Canada has a parliament. <laughs> Sorry. Right. right. Yeah. Knowledge is always limited. But Canadians have always been ahead of, uh, in terms of a government and a dietary concepts ahead of the US by a decade or two. Oh, perhaps. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. That was so. We harmon we, we, the, we the big buzzword is harmonizing with you know, with you in the USA now for for trade purposes and for yeah 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 yeah. So that they hide behind that when it's convenient. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. You, these euphemisms are very helpful. I you know my, my medical school was in Seattle, which is attended to uh, I think most Canadians. This is before the Toronto school uh, was created, and so it was very clear you had to uh, watch your references to the you know anything between the countries and just keep it something like that tucked it under a euphemism it was very helpful in terms of yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah so uh, i wanted to go back to um so mct oils my first uh when you did your poster presentation back at the metabolic therapy conference of i think it's about four years ago um i don't think i knew that much about mct oils other than i knew what they were and it was the jar of coconut you know, congealed stuff that you found in the grocery store or wherever. But you made me think of, you know, separating out the MCT oils of C6, C8, C10, C12, and at least in terms of producing ketones, BHB, measured in blood, C8 was the most efficient. So is, and I won't say, is there anything to that? And there obviously is, because that's what you said. But now when you look back when we, when we reference MCT collectively, do you single out and I go, you know, um, well, C8 is great for BHB and probably acetoacetate, but you know, C10 has its function and who knows, maybe even C12. Do you, in your mind, have at least these separated out and they're different or it doesn't need to be separated out or they're all unique? Where are you on that? Because it was, it, it opened a door for me. To think of well, uh, we're, we're learning as we go along. I mean, when we started, I didn't really expect to see a difference between C8 and C10, for instance. I thought they were all ketogenic, and uh, it, it sort of uh, floored us initially to find out that C12 is not ketogenic at all. C10 is not a little bit, but C8 is the, is the big one. There's no uh, available source uh, of C6 that I'm aware of, so we haven't tested it. So this was an eye opener for us, and I do sometimes refer to what I call ketogenic MCT as it to distinguish them from non-ketogenic MCT, which is only a distinction as far as ketosis is concerned. What, whether it affects their biological roles, whether they have different biological roles, whether some of them are inert or are biologically active without being ketogenic is, is an open question. MCT generally go between 6 and 14 carbons. The 14 carbon uh, 
myristic acid. Well, no, the 12 carbon one is, is lauric acid. And lauric acid is the basis for soap. Um, soap, of course, is an antibacterial. So lauric acid uh, in, in several studies, and it's not work that I've done or, or know well, but it, it has antibacterial effects. So is lauric acid consumed in, in coconut oil, uh, having an antibacterial, anti-inflammatory, anti-xenobiotic effect in the, in the body? Um, possibly. I don't think there's any research that's really addressed it. So I, I, I would strongly discourage at least scientists and perhaps consumers, but scientists anyway, from putting all their MCT eggs in the same basket. It, they're not, it's not just ketosis, which is, is potentially important. When you separate C8 from C10, in fact, C9 and 11 and 12 have been studied in, in models of, um, of uh, epilepsy and, and seizures. Uh, they, they have different effects. And the C10 may be quite beneficial in seizures, um, and more so than, than C8. Hmm. Um, so, again, there could be effects that are not dependent on ketogenesis. Um, and these are, I need to be explored. We need more people working in this field. We need new, new tools. We need to know whether what you can see in a, in a Petri dish is actually relevant to the control of seizures in children or adults. Um, and there's lots of work to do here. Um, so I'm not dismissing coconut oil as a as useless because it's uh, not very ketogenic, but it is is very poorly ketogenic. It's only about three to five percent C8. Mm. So uh, anybody who thinks they're going to get into ketosis on the basis of coconut oil alone, I think is is actually sadly mistaken. Mm -hmm. But you're also uh, saying don't worry about it. It's got other benefits in a way. Well, I think it does. I think we can we can postulate that there are other benefits. I haven't seen any demonstration that coconut oil is anti-inflammatory uh, in older people, for argument's sake, and that the cytokines uh, respond in a way that suggests it's having a beneficial effect on the immune system. Uh, that those data may exist. I, I'm not aware of them. So uh, I think there's a lot of work to do. But it would be a mistake to assume that everything that MCT can do are based exclusively on, on ketones because I don't think that's the case. I agree. Do you have a hint? You mentioned you thought C, C10 might be relative to epilepsy and there's a lot of unknowns. I know there's a lot of unknowns. As you say, they still don't know really how, how the ketogenic diet works for epilepsy. And, there's, and that's a fascinating, all these other questions have come up, but um, anything a little more uh, deeper on C10 in terms of other than, you know, it's obviously less ketogenic. We got that off, but what it might do is it. I'm, I I know honestly I don't know anything about C10's effects apart from some in vitro work that has looked at, at seizures in in a in a submammalian species of cells. That's so. Is that close enough to to epilepsy control? It might be. Um, so I, no, there's a lot to learn, and then the effects of these fatty acids on on signaling processes. Um, they can bind to certain proteins, probably differentially between the C8, C10, C12. They talk they talk about meristylation, which is C14 being attached to different proteins, uh, like other fatty acids. It's a it's a huge potentially a huge field, and um, we we've stayed focused on trying to get more energy into the brain via ketones. So it's been important for us to explore ketogenic MCT um, and eventually maybe uh, other forms of ketogenic supplements, the salts, the esters. Um, yeah. What's the best way to go here? Right, right. That, that does beg that question. Do you see, certainly the salts and the esters have become very, very popular. This is now in terms of being ketogenic. Um, so we're to say salts, esters, C8 of the more efficient of all these MCTs relative to the ketones they make, is there a difference in, oh, uh, they all make acetoacetate, but it goes into BHB, or what, are, what is it we're measuring in terms of saying, you know, showing how they're, who's, who's more efficient, who's not more efficient? Do we say it all ends up at BHB, we're measuring BHB from esters and salt and C8, or we're we saying, no, some do acetoacetate, and acetoacetate is similar but different, it has its functions? Uh, it's, it's very tough to um, sort of be categorical about this because uh, there are a few data out there, and they're being, you know, people are buying these things, but they're for the personal use. So there's very little research that's been done into ketone esters or salts. Uh, there has been work on ketone esters and athletic performance. Uh, and that's 
some of that's been published. It looks like ketone esters gram for gram are the most ketogenic uh, of the supplements. The problem with the salts, uh, is, in my view, is that there's no acetoacetate salts because it's harder to make. Um, and the beta-hydroxybutyrate uh, comes in two chemical forms that call the D and the L. Uh, it tends to be a mixture of the D and the L in most products because it's less expensive, but only the D is considered to be truly biologically active. There's not even much research on that. So sometimes we're, we're making assumptions that the L is not doing much because basically because we don't know. Uh, so the bottom line is that uh, at the moment, I think we could make a sort of a, a hierarchy, but the highest being the ketogenic, uh, the, the ketone esters, beta-hydroxybutyrate salts are probably the second most ketogenic gram for gram, and the C8 comes afterwards. But bear in mind that if C10 is doing something beneficial, uh, the salts may or may not contain MCT. Uh, People have been hedging their bets, and there's products out there that combine salts and MCT now. Um, so there's all kinds of things. But if the MCT is mostly C14, you're not getting any, you know, from coconut oil, you're not, you're not going to get any more ketones out of it. It's just diluting the ketone effect, right. basically, of the, of the supplements you're taking. Right. So it's a bit of a minefield out there, and I'm certainly not keeping track of all the products that are out there or, or how well they affect ketones. Um, right, right. We, it would be nice to have more research and, and I think it's going to come. Um, it's going to have to come if, if any of these companies are going to be more successful because they're, they're going to need to be able to, to base it on, on some scientific progress uh, eventually. And that's what will break open the market for them. I, I think. That's right. The, the old uh, research and development on a per product basis. Do you feel, I mean, this is an unfair question. Do you feel that if there isn't a patent behind it, so the incentive to do research about it is less, is less period, and I'm speaking of uh, C8, C10, whatever, of the MCT components versus esters and salts. I mean, if there's no patent, it's like, it's a little bit like saying, you know, who wants to do research on chamomile to see if it, you know, increases GABA? You know, anybody can grow chamomile and make chamomile tea, and, you know, it's just interesting research, but that's not going to recoup any, uh, won't be able to recoup those costs from a profit on a product. Well, few companies can afford to invest in research unless they've got a market share that, that, that justifies it. And, and if, the, if someone else can come up with the same product without any costs, obviously it makes it less attractive and the profitability is going to go down. Yeah. There's still room to, to do work. There are public agencies that are very interested in this. The Alzheimer's Association has funded my work in the past uh, and is funding it currently. Um, and there are other agencies in, of which one could apply and say, look, uh, Company X is willing to supply me with this particular ketogenic supplement. We think this is the best thing to test in Parkinson's or in Alzheimer's or in epilepsy, for that matter. Uh, go get the public money. Uh, and so scientists can do this. They're not uh, forced to, to uh, depend on, on a company to supply them with the funds to do the actual project. Uh, so there are, are ways to advance the research with if you can get the public funding, which of course is not guaranteed. It's competitive. Uh, there's lots of misperceptions about ketones. So you fall on the wrong reviewers and you're going to get trashed and it's not going to go forwards. But, uh, but some of it is going forwards. Uh, and, uh, and some of it will go forward with companies that can identify molecules that, on which they can um, uh, patent mm -hmm. um, and it's a question of, of whether you see the market share and uh, get the investors to commit to to doing that and hopefully we've opened the door to to, to doing that with some people uh, let's see yeah, yeah absolutely uh, i had emailed back and forth with you uh, a while back and uh, you sent me a paper on um i believe it was uh i don't know if it was c in particular but uh, maybe the ketogenic diet relative to gaba increasing GABA concentrations, I'll leave it at that, and therefore uh, mood uh, associative changes. Um, any sort of insights on that? I thought that was really pretty interesting, and it also made me think of, certainly that would make sense, and then I think of gut issues, which are not head issues, like butyrate versus, which is preferred fuel for the uh, larger ball, and uh, BHB. I don't know of a direct connection, but it seems to be intuitively there too. Any thoughts on those two? Well, GABA is, is produced as a, quote, byproduct of the, of the Krebs cycle or the tricarboxylic acid cycle. 
um, which ketones help feed into. Um, and so GABA seems to go up, a couple of studies have shown that GABA seems to go up on the ketogenic diet. And um, that seems to be important for uh, obviously in reducing hyperexcitation in, in neurons and brain cells that are supposed to, are not supposed to be uh, firing at the time. So it, it allows the balance between excitation and, and inhibition in the brain to be a bit better controlled. It seems potentially to be one of the reasons why the ketogenic diet is improving uh, epilepsy, which is obviously a, a severe state of hyperexcitation in the brain. Um, some anti-epileptic drugs raise GABA. So there's, and they improve hyperexcitation in the hippocampus in mild cognitive impairment. There's some um, pathological similarity between Alzheimer's and uh, epilepsy. You, you, uh, Alzheimer's is associated with more epilepsy as you get older. And um, so there's indications that part of, of the onset of, of Alzheimer's has is, is got something to do with this excitation inhibition imbalance. And uh, if ketones are contributing to that, um, then maybe they're doing it via GABA. Um, that's, I think, one of the one one realistic way it could be happening, but by no means uh, is that the only way. No, no, I agree. I agree. Would you say this is when people talk about um, the ketones or ketogenic diet and mental clarity? Would you say it's a GABA associated? Uh, Attribute or I have no, I, I have no idea. Um, I've 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 cranked the ketones fairly high uh, on different supplements myself personally, and I never really f sort of felt this clarity thing come on. So um, maybe I'm already thinking well. I don't know. <laughs> but I, think, I think you are. You know, it's you're a, it's like a, a of one that should be you know, ruled out. You're <laughs> too much of an outlier. Well, I'm an outlier, perhaps, but I'm, um, anyway, I haven't experienced the clarity thing. So uh, maybe those who do, uh, it's it's happening with GABA. I'm not sure. Do you have any guesses in terms of, let me say, anti-inflammation and gut? And before you have to answer that, my whole background in coming into the ketogenic diet was less about medicine. I basically had to be kicked into it because of death in our family and financial stress due to our medical practice and so on and so forth, I uh, blew up in very severe uh, Crohn's and UC. My wife had a, a brain tumor that was part of the stress too and never had that. And uh, they're about to think about bowel resection if the steroids didn't work and they didn't. So I quickly, you know, looked into other things and got into the ketogenic diet. So in my inflammation dropped like a stone. And so I you know, I, I see results. I'm an N of one. Maybe I'm an outlier in this particular situation. But what's and so I think, well, BHB, butyrate, and that's as far as I can go. Do you have any any thoughts on? Heck, it worked for you. Keep doing it. But anything uh, biochemical that draws these two together, cause and effect. Um, I, I don't have a a coherent answer. Um, in, in the sense that I, I'm aware of, of anecdotes like yours, and I'm very glad you uh, found the solution that you that, that worked for you. And uh, the ketones seem to have had something to do with with gut health. The ketogenic diet might be beneficial, as we've said. Beta hydroxybutyrate has effects on what they call the inflammasome. The, the funny thing about the ketogenic diet is it can be almost fiber free. Uh, no, but one person's ketogenic diet is not the same as another's. Um, the gut obviously depends on short chain fatty acids for its health. And that comes from fermenting fiber, which ultimately comes from sources of carbohydrate. I, sent, I think I can say exclusively. So if your carbohydrate, if your ketogenic diet is, has got very low fiber because you're focused on the fat and, and, and the meat, um, then you're going to have a hard chain time maintaining the short chain fatty acids that your gut microbiome needs. Um, and so if your diet does have fiber, then you're going to get those short chain fatty acids. And butyrate, I think, is one of the main fuels of, of the um, endothelial cells lining the gut. So all that's a little bit fuzzy. It's a bit conjectural. It feels good. I, I'm not sure how the biology of all that works. I've, I've not explored it. It's not an area I, I know enough to, to go much further on. Is it a solution to gut inflammatory disorders? Um, I guess in your case it is, N of one. Yeah. Um, there's probably many other people who've had the similar experience. I, I, I just uh, don't know enough about it to say.
No, no, good answer. And it is exactly that paradox of saying, well, wait a minute, you know, certainly this is classic medical school, if not nutrition in general, short chain fatty acids come from fiber, you need the fiber to, and otherwise you're not going to get the puree. rate. And then along comes, uh, I, you know, I've for last year sort of just cut out veggies, which is extreme for my life. And uh, I think things have even, they're already good, but I, I haven't missed them. And therefore I have whatever fiber you can get from primarily proteins and so on. So it's like, it challenged that whole concept. I'm, you know, like, wow. I, you know, I'm, I'm well, you, you can eat f- fiber containing vegetables um, on a ketogenic diet. You need to, to limit them, but they can certainly be present. Yep. It's not like you've got to be carbohydrate free. Yep. Uh, and they, they're mostly to use a, a term that's a little bit abused, I think, but they're mostly low glycemic index. Mm-hmm. So you're not going to be stimulating insulin very much. Um, and that goes for soluble fibers like oats as well. You know, you don't really have to worry about glucose too much if you have a bowl of oats for breakfast. Mm-hmm. Uh, it depends on how much fruit you throw on top and how much low-fat yogurt and et cetera, et cetera. Or, so it, it depends on what you add to them, of course. But Yep, yep. No, no, I agree. Like even in – I have on my bulletin board, uh, certainly in talking with the Charlie Foundation and Beth, that, you know, there's in essence five different – quote unquote, uh, ketogenic diet for epilepsy, mostly pediatric epilepsy. And, you know, and she was saying you just have to work from one to the other. And we don't have everybody's on this one versus that one. And uh, it, it is all over. But it's interesting. You know, it's it presents some uh, big, big rescues, so to say, in terms of uh, pediatric epilepsy. And yet there's five different variations, one being the low glycemic diet. Well, they may all have some things in common and they may have some things that are quite different and they, some people with certain polymorphisms and certain enzymes and so on, genetic differences, APOE4 or I, who knows, I, I'm just making it up, yeah, yeah. could make a big difference to the way they process or obviously the population of bugs in their microbiome can, will vary from one person to the next and um, certain types of ketogenic diets are going to be more effective for that reason and others less. Truly. Really? Truly, yeah, no, it's it's and once you get into the microbiome, it's not clear cut, <laughs> you know, it's a it's a big soup of things. One last question before I let you go, and I know I've jumped around. I could have gone through your slides, which are each one is a, a topic in itself. Is that when you were talking about brain rescue, and that's such a big term, you basically what you would use, and I'm reading now, uh, brain ketone uptake in Alzheimer's disease before and after two different MCTs, 30 grams, which is about two tablespoons per day or two and a half tablespoons a day of MCT oil. Do you see that, was that easy to do in terms of real life saying, hey, you know, we can work in two or three tablespoons of MCT oil into somebody's diet? Or in, in, were all these like, like for instance, the story of Dr. Mary Newport's husband, you know, she was the caregiver. So she yep. did this for her husband. And, um, or do you see this as like, you know, just put it in their food and uh, no. Be- no, we realized fairly quickly that we weren't, we weren't going to just be putting it in their food for, first of all, um, people, uh, older people like to have a, a fairly, at least in our experience, like to have a, a fairly simple plan. Um, if this is the supplement I got to take, I'll take it, but, but don't tell me to, to sort of mix it with my orange juice one day and my cereal the next day and my soup the next day, because they, they just lose track and they lose interest. So we started, we were starting with them and with mild cognitive impairment, although we used the product again uh, in Alzheimer's disease and we realized we uh, needed to have a placebo and we wanted it in a drink because it's also better absorbed and is more ketogenic than a mouthful of MCT, which is not only not that tasty, but it's not actually as ketogenic as if, as when it's well emulsified. So mm-hmm. what, what are we going to emulsify it in? And we settled for better or for worse on, on uh, lactose free skim milk which we could get processed by a, through a dairy process, a dairy processing plant. In fact, a sterile product could be made that was uh, 12% MCT in, in, a, in a cup of, of lactose-free skim milk per day. That would pr- provide the 30 grams of MCT, half in the morning and half in the, af- in the evening. And we could use uh, placebo, which was exactly the same, but contained no MCT and used high oleic acid sunflower oil as, as a replacement. So we had the same calories from fat and, and carbohydrate and protein, and they were matched. Um, 
So that was the basis for the study uh, that, that you talked about. And we used that in a six month study in MCI because we were studying cognitive outcomes and we wanted to be sure that there was no way that we were influencing the way people were um, responding to these cognitive tests. So we had to have a placebo and be blinded, uh, randomized. In the Alzheimer's study you referred to, it was just metabolic, but we had the product. And so we used that product to, to test the brain's response to to a, a ketogenic MCT. It was the same MCT in lactose-free skim milk. Got which it. you can make at home. You can put it in a blender. Buy, you can buy lactose-free skim milk and blend it with, with milk. You can, or you can take the milk protein if you want, or you can take soy protein if you prefer a, a vegetarian base. Um, you can use water. Um, you can make your own emulsion, your own cocktail, uh, and do it, do it whatever way you want to. Have you ever added it with lecithin? I mean, it just tends to, you know. I haven't. We possibly could. Um, you know, I wasn't, I'm not a food chemist. I'm not a food scientist. And we uh, uh, had a connection with a dairy pilot plant at another university that could make this stuff for us under sterile conditions. And I said, let's just try it and see. Yep. And um, it was acceptable tasting. It was, there was no flavor added, so it's quite a neutral flavor. In fact, lactose-free skim milk is somewhat sweeter tasting because it's got the lactose is converted to glucose. Hmm. And that makes it somewhat sweeter, which makes it a little more tasty. Right, right. So, so given that, that experience and that study, would you say, hey, why don't we do another one with, with more, with a higher dose, or would you change it? I mean, so you've you well, Go ahead. With our testing, we sort of learned that you can get people to take 50, maybe even 60 grams a day. Some people respond better than others. Uh, is it microbiome based? What is it? Their, their stomach upset, the tendency to diarrhea is, is highly variable. So uh, we sort of um, have left it the two ways to get more ketones. One, we put more MCT in or we'll switch to a, a supplement that has more ketogenic uh, potential, which is either the ester or the supplement which is what we're, we're going to do now. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought there was a limit to, that we need more than 30 grams of MCT. I wasn't convinced that people would be compliant on a higher dose. So I said, I'm going to switch the supplement for now because we're still trying to establish the extent to which getting that brain a ketone rescue is actually the, the functional limitation on improving cognition. Mm -hmm. um, I, it looks like it, but it, it may not be the whole story. Yep. Yep. No, absolutely. In the uh, chart that I'm looking at right now of that study, you actually separated out uh, MCT, C8, C10 with, against um, C8. And it looks like C8 was uh, more effective in this, in this particular. With the two little uh, slopes, the lines. Um, yep. Yep. Uh, One's star and the other's triangle. Right. Yes. Well, they both overlap with the, the reference line. And, and so I, biologically, I don't think there's really any difference. Okay. But maybe if you were at higher levels, they, the, the curves would diverge perhaps at some point. Hmm. Interesting. Boy, I think you set the world on fire, Stephen. You know, I, I, I so uh, love the work. I love your presentations um, that you've given at the various locations throughout the States uh, primarily. And well, I, thank you, Carl, for inviting me to, to talk to you about it. I appreciate very much your support. And perhaps at one of the next meetings, we'll actually shake hands. I hadn't really paid attention to, maybe you've mentioned in emails that you were going to be at these meetings, but I, I didn't know what you look like. So no, no. Um, well, you're usually, by the way, in case you're don't like, be shy, don't be shy. Come on, say hello. <laughs> Do you know how many people are, are caked around you at the end of your talk? Well, sometimes, sometimes. But, uh, <laughs> yes, we will definitely meet up. And I'll definitely bring, bring a case of beer and, and I'll, I'll ignore them and I'll come and sit down. With them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I know. It has to have, does it have to be Canadian or just yeah, micro brew? Uh, a micro, yeah. <laughs> okay, anyways, I wish you well with your skiing. I think that's a whole other topic we'll get into. Maybe you will talk again, but I will definitely be. We'll be meeting in, per in person before that happens. Thank you again for your time. Happy to chat with you again about this, Carl. Thanks a lot. Right. Take care. All Take the best. Bye-bye. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp. I thought I would take a moment of your time to tell you about something that we've been working on for a long time, and that is our product of C8 Keto MCT Oil. How is it different, and why would you even care about it? It's the highest purity you can find in the market, which is 99.7%. Caprylic acid triglyceride. And by the way, that's backed up by a certificate of analysis. It's not just me making up these numbers. But I think the bigger story behind 
RC8 MCT oil is not only that it is the most efficient way for you to create ketones naturally, and that is all three ketones, your beta-hydroxybutyrate, your acetoacetate, and your acetone. That's important. But the other part is it supports sustainably harvested palm oil. Why would you care? Because all the other C8 oil products out there, not the MCT oils, but the C8 MCT oils, some people call them ketogenic oils out there, they come from palm oil. And palm farming, specifically palm kernel farming in Southeast Asia, is decimating the rainforest there. Absolutely. You go on right now to Google or to YouTube and say palm oil Southeast Asia, and you will be in tears at the end of 10 minutes when you see the destruction that's happening. This is not part of that. This is the exception. So it's called RSPO, Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil. You have to apply for it. You have to be audited by them. And it's a long, rigorous process. And it took us two years to bring this product to market. I hope you care. And I know you'll care about the efficiency in which it helps you make ketones. By the way, we don't drink this like it's a fluid. We put a little bit in our coffee. We make our mayonnaise out of it. We make... Uh, various salad dressings out of it when we have a salad. It's basically a, I hate to say crutch, but it's my aid to keeping me in ketosis when I want to be in ketosis. It's fast. It's long lasting, certainly long, longer lasting than exogenous ketones and much more holistic, as I mentioned, with all three ketones. That's about as much as I want to say. I hope you look into it. I hope you uh, take your ketones readings on a regular basis as along with your glucose. If you do, then you really value this product. All the best, and I thought you should know.